Well, I'd like to welcome everyone again. I do appreciate the time that you take to uh, tune into these videos and to watch them and some of the comments that have been made of encouragement that they have been to you. And I appreciate that as well. And, you know, may God use these uh, messages to uh, encourage you and strengthen you. And that is uh, our goal, of course. Uh, we're going to continue our look at the 12 uh, definitions of the word learning as we had left off last week, I believe on number eight. Uh, but before we get that far, as always, I'd like to give you the update on the uh, virus statistics across the United States and around the world. And the reason I'm doing that, obviously, is that no one reports how many people have recovered from the virus. And, uh, and I just feel like that's kind of a disservice to everybody and it keeps everybody living in fear. Uh, of which I don't, uh, I don't believe is right. And so that's why I do uh, these. And again, you can go to, uh, uh, look at it on yourself, at Worldometer, uh, it's called. And uh, if you go on Worldometer, you can uh, Google it and type that in, and it'll come up with the same information that I'm giving you uh, right now. Uh, so around the world, uh, the number of cases has risen to 6 mil 16 million on 958,000. Uh, but out of that, worldwide, this would include the states, is 664,600 people have uh, passed away uh, due to the coronavirus. And again, if you're looking at 16 million with uh, 600 and some thousand that have passed away, uh, again, as I've always said, you know, the percentages of the people that have it that pass away are very, very small. And the number of recoveries around the world, which is wonderful because it's beyond double now, is 10,506,000 have recovered uh, from around the world. And so that is wonderful. And just here in the United States, and of course, as you listen to different media sources, uh, again, you know, they've got all these numbers climbing up and that type of a thing. And, uh, and I've always maintained that part of that is because testing has uh, definitely increased. Um, I'm beginning to know more and more people that visit a clinic or a doctor, even if it's for something else, uh, other than cold or fever or flu or symptoms or whatever it may be, uh, they're being asked to be tested and getting their permission to test that person. So the testing has increased. Uh, but here in the States, 4,501,000 people uh, have been diagnosed with the virus. And then out of that, 152,400,000 have died, or 400 has died. So 152,400 have passed away again. Percentage-wise, is not a very large percentage. And that 2,189,600 uh, have recovered in the United States from the virus. And so uh, that is your update. I hope that encourages you. And uh, again, we've got to be cautious. You know, you need to wear your mask when you have to, social distance when you need to. Uh, hand sanitizing, of course, is always good for that and being cautious. Uh, but again... You know, it's not always a death sentence for somebody that gets it. Matter of fact, more people now are being, uh, you know, are being recovered or are recovering. And so that is always an encouragement to us. So now where I left off last week was on lesson number seven. And that was, I talked about laying aside your plans for God's plans. And uh, the response to that was very good because I think all of us have made plans and we have watched them, uh, you know, crumble at our feet, get discarded, completely change. And I think a lot of people have experienced that in their life and maybe more than once in their life. And so that was an encouragement to them. So let's move on uh, concerning the idea of learning and what the Bible tells us that we are to be as Christians is learning about God, learning about his word, learning about how he operates, learning about Jesus, uh, learning about the Holy Spirit. So doing the learning. And so that was the point of doing this series uh, was uh, you know, it was learning. What are we to learn as Christians? And so that was where our journey has been. And so number eight then is what we're going to look at and is learning to crucify our flesh. Now, if somebody is listening to this and you're not a Christian, you wouldn't understand that at all. And so let me take a moment to explain it to you. Uh, as human beings, we have a sinful disposition. I mean, that's just part of our carnal nature. Uh, you know, we lie, we cheat, we steal. Uh, you know, we, 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 we get drunk, you know, we're, we're all of these things, and I'll read a list in just a moment, but that's our carnal nature. 
And uh, without Christ, and I'm as guilty as anybody else before Christ, that's how we lived our lives. That's how I lived my life before Jesus came into my life and not only uh, forgave me of my sins, but then also changed my life. And of course, I could not have done that uh, without the power of the Holy Spirit living in me and help, uh, obviously, from the power of the Lord. So as we look at this, this is talking about crucifying the flesh. The word to crucify means to nail something. Uh, that's why with Jesus, we talk about Jesus being crucified. Uh, he was nailed to a cross, and there he died. And so Paul will use that phraseology uh, in his epistles as he's writing to the churches and writing to the Christians and saying, you know, we need to crucify our flesh. In other words, we need to take it and we need to kill it. We need to crucify it and get rid of that desire, uh, that sinful desire that is in us as human beings. And it's a very difficult thing to do. You know, it's a hard thing to do. And it takes years and years and years of serving the Lord and getting help with the Lord's strength, you know, overcoming those desires that we know are not pleasing to the Lord. And so as we look at this, there's a couple of things that I want to share with you about this one. And they're going to be out of Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, uh, Paul is writing to the church of Colossus. And he is uh, explaining to them what exactly this means. And so in chapter 3, beginning at verse 5, and I'm going to read out of the Amplified Bible. And the Amplified Bible takes uh, some of the words uh, that are in there, and it will expound on the Greek meaning of the word. Uh, now, it's not a deep explanation, but it just adds a little more insight to what is being written because the Bible was written originally in Greek in the New Testament and of course Hebrew in the Old Testament, and the Amplified Bible will take and shed a little more light on both those languages depending on where you are reading. And so what I'd like to do then is just have you take a look at what this says. Now in verse five then it says this, and he says, so kill, okay, kill, but not literally kill, all right? Just don't want people getting upset, okay? Kill or crucify the old man. To, so kill, it is to deprive the power that evil desire lurking within us. And that's exactly what this is about, that human nature in every human being that each of us have to do something that is not right in according to God's word or in the eyes of the Lord. There's that desire that is lurking within us, those impulses that are earthly, and that's what we are, we're just earthly beings, all right? Earthly in you, that is employed in sin. Sexual vices, unholy desires, impurity, sensual appetites, all greed and covetousness. In other words, somebody's got something I want, I covet it, and so I'm going to do what I can to take it from them, so that way then I can have what they've got, that's covetousness. For that is idolatry. That means you're worshiping something other than God. And whatever that is, he said, that's idolatry. That is worship. The defying of self and other created things instead of God. In other words, it is worshiping something, wanting something more than wanting God. That's idolatry. And so Paul lists these things. And I can tell you, in the almost 40 years now that I've been a Christian, uh, many of these things I don't personally struggle with because God has given me victory over them and, you know, I just don't worry about it. But he's got another list here in just a moment. But he says this in verse 6. It is on account of these very sins that the holy anger of God is ever coming on the sons of disobedience. In other words, there is a time where there is going to be a judgment of God. Now, people can laugh at that. People can say, well, that's just stories. That's not true. Uh, but again, if you look at the book of Revelation, clearly there is going to be a judgment coming upon the earth of those that disobeyed God and did not want to follow him. And so Paul is saying the same thing. There's a price to pay for this disobedience. And the truth is, is that's true. You know, I mean, even now, if you don't see this huge judgment coming across the planet, you know, people do pay for their sin. You know, if it's a sexual sin, sometimes people contract a disease and the disease, they say there's no cure for it, or maybe they'll even die for it. And you'll see people that are greedy, and they'll try to steal from other people. They'll start to steal from companies, organizations, or even from the government. And they get caught, and they end up going to prison. You know, so there is a price to pay for sin. 
whether we get caught now or we get caught later, there's a price to pay, as always. And so when we read this, we need to realize that no matter what sin it is, there's always a price to pay for that. Uh, you know, you could drink for 40 years uh, and then you have cirrhosis of the liver. Well, it's because you drink for 40 years. You know, so I mean, there's always, there can be a price for sin. And that's what Paul is saying here. He said, there will be a price that will be paid. Verse 7, now among whom you also once walked. Now notice this. This is how you used to live. And this is for Burles. This is for anybody. Because nobody is born a Christian. No one is born saved. This is an effort and a work on our part to become the Christian that God wants us to be. And through that process of maturing, he shows us the things that aren't pleasing to him. And then we begin to crucify those things or get them out of their life. So Paul makes it clear here. He said, this is how you used to live. This is how you once walked. When you were living and when living in and addicted to such practices. And that is true. You know, we, and we've seen it. And, and I will point out, remember pastors, you know, television evangelists, television preachers, people that, you know, most people have heard about uh, were addicted to sins or something was wrong and it, it came out on the news. I mean, and so they were human. And so they're addicted to this. And so it's not, it doesn't make it right that what they were doing, but he says people are addicted. And so you may be listening to this and you may be battling an addiction as a Christian that you're still struggling with and uh, you've been trying to give it to the Lord, get victory over it. Well, you know, keep coming to the Lord. Keep asking him to help you, strengthen you, and deliver you. And at some point, it will happen. Uh, now, I have noticed in some people's lives that when the Lord realizes that that person cannot get over that struggle on their own, what ends up happening then is light is brought to it. The Word of God tells us that God is light and there is darkness around us. And so a lot of times when people are doing something that's not pleasing to the Lord and you're a Christian trying to serve for him, but you've got this one weakness that you, you, know, you just can't seem to get the victory over, um, you know, they get caught. You know, you get caught. And then when you get caught, whether it's in pornography, whether it's lying, whether it's, uh, you know, stealing, whatever that might be, whether no matter what it is, if you get caught, I'm telling you, the, the power of that brings actually brings a deliverance. It's a terrible thing at the time, but it brings deliverance. And so that's part of sometimes how God operates. But I know people that have been gone through that experience, but once, you know, it was all settled and done, you know, they'll never do it again. And, and so uh, in a way, it was God's grace that let them get caught so that they could get victory over something that they knew they were struggling with anyway. And so he says in here, he says that these things we're addicted to and these practices, and God wants to get rid of them out of our lives. Now, verse 8, but now, now this is the next thing. So like I said, the, the list up above is things that you deal with, things I've had to deal with. But now notice this, verse 8, but now put away, rid yourselves completely of all of these things. Now, here's this list, anger. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm human. There are some things that I can still get angry about, uh, you know, but he says, put that away from you. And, and you, what you don't want to do is be angry. And as the Bible says in Proverbs, he says, and don't let your, the sun go down on your anger. In other words, you, you're angry now, but by the end of the day, forgive that person, put it under the blood, get rid of it, forget it. Don't go to bed angry tonight because tomorrow you're going to wake up with that same thing, that feeling of anger. And he's saying, put it off to the side. And I know that's a very difficult thing to do, but it is what we are asked to do as Christians. He says, so get rid of anger, get rid of rage, you know, that I'm going to get even, I'm going to get you, you know, uh, bad feelings towards others. Uh, this is something that is very important for us in the church and in the Christian world, because, uh, you know, Christians are like family. And, uh, you know, sometimes family uh, says things and does things to each other that it hurts. And uh, Christians do the same thing. If you're listening to this and you're not a Christian, if you're waiting to find a perfect Christian, you will never become a Christian. You know, there's people that says, well, look at you guys. Look at the church. Why should I be saved? Listen, being saved and becoming a Christian is so that you can get to heaven and for eternity. 
I mean, that's the whole point of Christ dying on the cross. It's not to make us perfect human beings because there isn't any on this planet. There never will be any on this planet until Jesus returns. Uh, there is no perfection. So what do we need to do? You know, we need to remember that when we have conflict with a brother or sister in Christ and it creates bad, hurtful feelings, we need to be able to forgive them. And we need to be able to go to those people and ask for that forgiveness. Uh, you know, I've had to do it. I've had to humble myself before the Lord and go to somebody and go to people and say, you know what, this is what came out of my big mouth and I apologize and I didn't mean it that way and to work through those things. And so it's very important that we do that. It says, so bad feeling towards each other, curses, you know, using foul language, uh, you know, or saying, you know, uh, you know, cursing someone in a way of, well, I hope they go to, you know, where. Uh, you know, trying to, you know, making that statement and not realizing that you're really wishing to condemn somebody to hell. And, you know, the Bible says, you know, you don't need to do it. Don't do that. Slander, uh, which is saying uh, false tales about somebody or, or you hear a rumor about somebody and you're not sure if it's true or not. But because, you know, it's kind of kind of juicy, you know, you're going to go tell somebody else that's gossip. That's rumors. That's wrong. Uh, foul mouth abuse, you know, abusing people around you, whether it's a child or whether it's a spouse, uh, you know, abusing people uh, or people that you come in contact with, uh, you know, abusing them verbally. He says, stay away from all of this stuff. Uh, and it says, and shameful utterances from your lips. He says, just stop it. You know, don't, you know, there's no reason for you to talk that way. Um, you know, my, I've heard and probably used about every word in the language years and years ago, especially spending four years in the Army. Um, you know, but as I've gotten older, I don't need to watch programs that are using four-letter words or getting bleeped out every four sentences. It's a bleep, 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 bleep. I, got no, I have no time for that. You know, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to build a house, then build the house. You don't need to cuss along the way. If you're going to remodel the car, remodel the car. You don't need to cuss along the way. And unfortunately, so many programs, uh, you know, that's what they're doing. You know, they're bleeping it all out. And it's like, just, you know, stop the nonsense. Grow up, you know. If you're going to remodel something or build something or do something, then, you know what, just build it. Show, show your skill in your building and in your craft, not the stuff coming out of your mouth because, you know, you want to use four-letter words through the whole program. And so I get to that point, and I just mute it or I shut it off or turn it to a different channel. And so, uh, you know, so it's this thing, you just kind of, as Christians, you get tired of hearing that kind of language. And you're like, you know what, I don't need this. Uh, so he goes on here, now notice, then he goes on even farther for us. For us, Do not lie to one another. He says, don't lie to each other as Christians. Be honest. You know, just tell people, you know, okay, I, uh, thanks for the invite for dinner, but we can't make it. And, and just learning to be able to do that. Sometimes as Christians, we don't want to hurt other people's feelings, so we'll come up with some kind of, story on, you know, why we can't go here or can't go there. You know, I've learned just to be honest and they appreciate it. They may not like it, but at least be honest. Say, you know what? I can't, uh, you know, or whatever it may be. Or, or if you promise to help somebody and then after you promise it later on, you regret saying, geez, no, I don't know why I told my help them. I really don't want to do it. And then you fabricate this huge story on why you really can't make it. And the truth is, is you're lying. And so he says, you know, don't lie to one another. For you have stripped off, ripped off, tore off, notice, and the old unregenerated self with its evil practices. He says, you, you're, you're ripping it off. You're becoming a new creature in Christ. You know, I remember when I first became a Christian and the Lord was so gracious to me because I had so many bad habits and language and I smoked for years. Uh, and, and drinking, uh, almost got killed in a car accident, you know, coming home from a bar one night, uh, flipped and rolled a car, hit a telephone pole. Uh, they, they estimated the car hit at 70 miles an hour. I had been thrown from the vehicle before it hit the telephone pole. And thank God I did. I know it was God because the telephone pole and the driver's seat became one. And, uh, and I would have been killed instantly. And so by God's grace, uh, you know, he saved me from that accident. And I remember when I became a Christian and I gave my life to the Lord, um, the number of people that just thought it was fake, thought it was phony, uh, the number of people that said, you know, hey, this isn't going to last. Um, you know, you'll be back in the bars with us. 
or you'll be over here doing this and over here doing that within six, seven months. Uh, the people that said, you know, uh, you'll never change. Nobody changes. Everybody stays the same. You know, no one changes. And trying to explain to them that, you know what, you're right. In the world, people don't change. People don't change unless they have to change. People don't change unless it hurts bad enough to change. But people don't change. But I can tell you that once I gave my life to Christ, he delivered me from alcohol. I mean, once I said yes to Jesus, that was my last trip to the bar. Just the desire was just gone. You know, and other habits that I had, he just was gone. And, and, and the only one that could have done it was the Lord. And so people do change. And it isn't because I wanted to. It isn't because I even needed to or, want, or, or had to. I mean, at some point I would have, but it's just that by God's grace, he showed me his power. And he set me free. And I, and I say that because we change. And I didn't change out of my own doing. I didn't change out of my own strength. I didn't quit drinking from my own strength. I didn't quit smoking because of my own, you know, I didn't, I stuck to it, you know, ooh, you know, stuck to it, had to quit the cigarettes. Oh, I tell you, I can't tell you how many times I crumbled up a pack of cigarettes and said, these are my last ones. And I went back to the garbage can to dig them out, the ones that weren't broken and started smoking again. I couldn't do it on my own. I needed the Lord. And by his grace and his patience, he delivered me from all of those things. And in doing so, then he works on these other things. He wants to make sure that we know the anger, the slander, the bad mouthing, the foul languages, the bitterness, all of those things that happen to us in life, that we're able to get over that, to forgive the people that have hurt us, forgive those that we have hurt. And I mean that in a way because maybe we're getting even and we need to be forgiven for that. Just all of that stuff. And Paul says, you, you need to get over that. And this is the change that takes place. And so this, you know, being a Christian isn't a 10-step program or 12-step program or any of that stuff. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then now in verse 10, he says this. He says, now, and have clothed yourselves with new spiritual self. Clothing yourself, wrapping yourself up in the power of the Holy Spirit. And again, not on yourself. It's a new, it's a new, you're a new self. I'm a new person, but it is done by the power of God. Renewed and remodeled into a fuller and more perfect knowledge upon knowledge after the image and the likeness of him, Jesus Christ, who created it. He said that is what it is all about. We are now clothed, wrapped up, as a new human being with a new spirit and with all of that stuff being removed from our lives. Now, again, nobody's perfect, and I certainly am not. And at moments, I get, I may get upset, I may get angry, uh, you know, and do something, say something, but I tell you what, uh, serving the Lord was the best decision that I ever made because my life was going nowhere. And I just pray, I pray that as you listen to this today, that you'll just take a look at your heart this is for Christians. You know, this, this is for you that are believers because this is Paul's instruction to us, telling us, if you're a Christian, this flesh of yours should be getting crucified and what you used to be like should be getting removed. And what God wants in you, Galatians chapter five, verse four and going on, chapter four and going on, talks about the, 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 the fruit of the spirit, it talks about the sins of the spirit and in Galatians, and he says that, and he says, what is God cultivating in you? Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance. And again, such, he says, there is no law. There is, he is bringing something into us that we can use and be serving the kingdom of God. A grace being delivered, a knowledge, all of those things that we've been delivered from now and he's replacing them with something else, and that is the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, we are out of time already, and we only got down through eight, and so, uh, but that's fine. That's we, We've got uh, plenty of time to do these things. So again, thank you so much. I, I do appreciate uh, those that are listening, those that have been encouraged by this. Uh, and as we work through all of these things, uh, my hope is as Christians is that we will get stronger and stronger in serving the Lord and our commitment to him. And if you're not a Christian, 
uh, again, you know, making you look at your own life, you know, just examining it and saying, okay, you know what, I'm tired of how I'm living. All some of that list of the stuff that you read, that's how I lived. And uh, I need to be delivered. I need God to forgive me of my sins. And so we'll, let's pray. Lord, I pray for each believer, even myself, as I have gone through the nearly 40 years now of serving you, realizing that so many things in this flesh, that desire that we have has to be crucified and laid aside and then but renewed by the power of your Holy Spirit, taking on a new man, as, a, as Paul would write. So I pray, Lord, for each Christian as they grow in you, the Lord, they would not get discouraged. They may stumble over something a hundred times, uh, but your grace is there. And if they get committed to it and they mean it, you'll forgive them and give them the strength ultimately to have the victory over whatever it may be. And then I also pray, Lord, for those that are listening to this that are not saved. You know, Lord, I pray, I pray that they would understand that this walk of ours as Christians, it's one thing to walk with you on this earth, but the ultimate goal is when we die, we go to heaven. And Lord, that is really the point of all of this, is that we are redeemed and that we are walking with you. And those that die without Christ, your word clearly tells us that it's, it's an eternity in hell. And then people would just take the time to look at the book of Revelation and read what hell is about. You know, a lake of fire, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. I mean, just the whole idea of that uh, would, would hopefully at least convict them to make them realize, man, I want to spend an eternity like that. So I hope the Holy Spirit, pray the Holy Spirit would speak to each of the hearts. Again, thank you, Lord God, for the privilege of coming into homes and to hearts right now. And I pray the Holy Spirit continue to do a deep work in each person that listens to these programs. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me into your home and uh, or wherever you may be at listening to these things. And uh, next week, we'll take a look at uh, number nine. Okay. God bless all of you. And thanks again.